During this period of the 19th century, we see incredible technological advancements, many of which have direct impact on, in on interior design. First of all, we see the use of steel. Now, they're developing the Bessemer process. We get very good, strong steel. And one of the most important buildings built during this period using this new steel is going to be the Crystal Palace, built for the 1851 Great Exposition in England. And it is glass and steel. They truly thought at the time that the glass would fly out. It would be cutting people in half on a windy day. The steel wouldn't be strong enough and would fall down. This is the first time they're not building something like this, and especially of this size, out of stone or other uh, common material. So this is a massive shift. It allows for these massive open pavilions. This one is open, not a lot of columns, huge amounts of light, of course, pouring in because the whole thing is glass. So it's going to be remarkable. It's going to shift how we build structures, especially commercial structures. Of course, it plays some role in the home, but mostly commercial. We're going to see the use of fasteners like we haven't seen before. Up until this point, most furniture is built using mortise and tenon or dowel construction. And we're going to see the use of nails and screws far more often. It's much more easy to use, or it's much easier to use nails and screws and other metal fasteners in manufactured design. So here I've got a couple of quick and dirty charts. If you're looking at an old nail or an old screw or a piece of furniture, you can determine its rough age. So of course we go from hand wrought nails to wire nails, which are cut. Uh, instead of being handmade, especially during the Industrial Revolution, about 1890. And in terms of screws, of course, those are all flathead screws of varying forms. Some of them hand-turned pre-1760, and then we start into more and more manufactured technique. But by the time we get to 1860, they're very common. They're machine-turned, which means the screw itself, this is going to be very, very regular. Uh, whereas otherwise you would see some imperfections in earlier screws. And if you're ever looking at a Phillips head screw, I can guarantee you it's after uh, World War II. So it's kind of a nice thing if you're dating a piece of furniture. Now, of course, this brings up the issue of dating furniture. And it gets really tricky in this period because we're going to see a lot of revival furniture. So amongst the other technologies, I want to just take this moment since I talked about nails and screws to talk about dating. Uh, always look at what are called the fixtures. In other words, the metal poles, the metal elements. Those will tell you a lot about construction. Look at the legs. They will give away the age frequently. Uh, look for nicks and irregularities because, of course, hand manufacture pre-1860 pre is very different from machine manufacture where you get a more perfect form. The wood type, of course, gives it away. And what I usually look for is, of course, the dovetails at the back of the drawers, which also give it away, but I've also talked about those already. Uh, this is also the age of the great exhibitions. We have the Great Columbian Exhibition in Chicago in 1893, we see, and that's The Devil in the White City, if you've read that book. Uh, we see the Great Exhibition of 1851. Really, these exhibitions are going on in Paris, London, and the United States. The Great Centennial Exhibition of 1876 in Philadelphia comes to mind. This is a time to show off. And what would happen is these exhibitions have a massive pavilion somewhere put on by these different nations. And you would go in and you would go to the French pavilion and see what the French are up to, really showing off their greatest inventions, their greatest idea. And for us, the importance being that there's always furniture design incorporated in this as well as art, which means... New furniture design is traveling around the globe faster and faster, at least in the Western world. 
And so it's trading back and forth. If there's a new French design, the English know about it right away. If the English have a new design, the Americans know about it pretty rapidly. And so things are getting tied much more closely together. We're not going to see the French with incredibly different ideas from the English or the Americans or the Germans uh, necessarily when we get into interior design. Things are going to start to harmonize. Then we see the use of reinforced concrete. Of course, concrete is fantastic as a material. We've used it since the Romans, but primarily under compression. So concrete, of course, is like stone. You don't want to pull on it, but it's great under compression. By reinforcing it, we also add the characteristics of steel, which is fantastic because now I can use it in places where it's going to see torsion, in places where it's going to see shear forces, and in some occasion, you can actually see it in places where you'll see tension on it because, of course, that steel uh, can take tension very, very well as while the concrete cannot. So this combination is really important. It allows us to build things that we would have never thought of building even 50 years prior. We see the invention of the elevator brake by a man by the name of Otis. Now, the elevator brake means that I can now build taller structures and people are going to feel safe in the elevator because the elevator will not fly down the shaft and smash into a million pieces, despite what movies might tell you. Uh, that generally doesn't happen. Of course, today we use magnets and other things to do this, but at the time it was a mechanical ratchet design. You would hear the elevator go up, and of course if it broke, if the rope at the top broke, uh, nothing really happens. You drop to the next ratchet, which would only be a few inches. In terms of tools, we see the mechanization of furniture manufacture. And so we're going to see the use of the mechanical bandsaw, mechanical circular saw, and other items. What this allows is far more accurate craftsmanship because I can now cut as long as I want, as straight as I want. Very, very important if I'm building a lot of furniture. And of course, the invention of plywood and masonite. Uh, plywood will be important, especially for the low end, uh, for inexpensive furniture. And masonite is one of those products that we tend to think of as very, very modern. But of course, it's about the middle of the 19th century and artists will use it to paint on quite a bit. Whereas the plywood will be used primarily for construction, either furniture or homes.